Hello, John Talley here with Partzilla.com. Welcome back into the studio for our live Q&A at 3 o'clock. Well, as you can tell by the computers on the, uh, on the bench, I've got the place to myself again. So hopefully we can get through this. And boy, the questions are already starting to pile on. And shoot, we'll just start out with number one here. Isaac, he says, I did a rebuild on my 400. When I finished it, it ran perfect for three weeks, and now I'm having trouble starting it. Any ideas? Well, a couple of questions. Um, which 400 was it? Was it a 400EX? And that isn't really critical. But my next question is, what all did you do to it? Was it just piston and, and rings, or did you put new valves in it? And if you did, did you seat them improperly by using that paste you know, to um, actually cut or cut them in a little bit. Because if they are new valves and you've been running it for a little while, chances are they're starting to really seat in and starting to wear just a little bit. And when that happens, that cuts the distance down for your, for your valve clearance. And then when you don't have enough clearance, it will be very difficult to start. So I'd be curious to see if that's what's happening on yours. So long answer short, check your valve clearance and see where that stands and then let me know. Mike is asking me, hi John, when working on my ATV and I need certain specifications for torque and I can't find it in my owner's manual, where can I look for this information? Well, your, your owner's manual is not going to have uh, your torque uh, specifications. The only places you're going to find that is either just doing a, a general search on the web, but be careful when you do that because you're getting somebody's opinion and they might not have your exact make, model, and year and, you know, exactly, and it could be off because there's certain variations even on the same type machine like the one sitting behind me. If you absolutely want to be sure, then you need to order a service manual for it, and that's going to have all the information as far as your, your specifications and your clearances. I mean, every build that I do, there is a manual nearby because there's no way anybody can remember all these facts and figures, especially me at my age. All right, Nick is asking me, hi, John, what are the best tires for a TRX350TE? It, there's so many of them out there, it's just beyond belief. Um, I've always been a big fan of the, the stock, and I want to share with you that I did make that mistake of going a little too aggressive on a tire on my um, 03 Rancher, which I still have. I mean, it was a, it was a nice tire, but it, had, it looked somewhat normal in the picture. By the time I got them, the, the tread on them was like this tall. And it changed the way the machine rode, and it didn't handle as well. And I did it great in the mud, but it, it just threw off the, the handling characteristics. Uh, I caution you not to get too aggressive on the tread pattern unless you're spending a lot of time in the mud. And even so, when you put a, that much of an aggressive tread, you're putting extra stress on the drivetrain. So be prepared that you're probably going to have to uh, grease the linkages and the fittings and everything else associated with it because there's more stress because of more torque or because of more bite. So don't get carried away would be my advice. As to which ones are the best tires, it's really up to you. Just make sure that they have uh, the correct ply rating at least equal to or greater than what you have on the machine right now. And that's probably going to be a six ply if memory serves. And hello to you, S-B-I-S-T-H, Sith name. <laughs> All right, Nick said, got my carburetor completely rebuilt and clean. Now my bike runs like it's brand new. Very good. I think I remember you from last week. Uh, I'm glad that you got that straightened out. All right, um, high-tech redneck. Oh, that's a neat handle there. <laughs> I, I'd almost want to steal that one. I'm getting ready to do a top end on my 400X. Is there anything in the valve train I should automatically replace or should I only replace if it's worn down? Um, the valve train, I'm, I'm betting it might be okay. Um, when you pull it down, take out the seals, you're definitely going to want to replace the valve stem seals. But just get in there and just feel it. If you put the valve in there with the spring off and, of course, and it rocks around a pretty good bit, you probably need to do something about that. Plus, it's very difficult to measure the inside of the, uh, the actual valve stem bore, but you can take a micrometer and just take a peek at your, uh, the diameter of the valve stem itself and make sure it's within spec. 
And for that, you're going to need to reference your, um, your, your service manual and not your owner's manual. But if, uh, one more thing, um, look at the wear pattern on the face of the valves and see if it's you know, the correct thickness and in the right orientation as far as the inner and outer. You want it toward the center of the valve face itself. And that'll give you another metric by which you have to decide, well, do I need to go in and replace these valves or not? All right, thinking of putting a 1300 gear on my 1800 VTX, what are your thoughts? I'm not sure what you're asking me there, <laughs> so give me a little bit more information. Good day, Ed, um, Adam, how are you doing today? And it was the 400EX um, Isaac was asking me about earlier. They have the same set of recommendations that I, I started off with, uh, that should apply. Takes me a little bit to catch up on the, uh, the chat. And you are welcome, David. Well, that's what we're here for, is to try to help you all out. Uh, Jennifer is asking me, I'm replacing a crankshaft. Don't I have to replace the bearings on the case or just the bearings on, on, the, uh, on the rods? Okay. I assume you're talking about the bearings on the, uh, the crankshaft itself. If you're having to replace the crankshaft, go ahead and do the bearings. Don't try to reuse anything, especially anything that you may have to press out. I mean, I don't know which uh, make and model that we're working here with, but just the sheer labor op or the amount of labor it takes to get all the way down to the crankshaft, I'm going to go ahead and replace well, just about everything. And so, yeah, I wouldn't try to use reuse any of it. <clears throat> do you sell valve seals for a 2400 inch or 350? I would bet yes. So, guys, if you would drop the part number in the uh, the chat for Carter. I'm, I'm sure that we do. Hello, Robert. How are you today? John has asked me, thank you very much for all the parts you have for my vintage bike, so I'm glad that we could help out. All right. All right, Mud Power is asking me, I rebuilt my Raptor 350 and I did the crank and oil pump and checked all the bearings and they were good. And it still knocks. Any ideas what else it could be? All right, when you were checking all the bearings, did you check, I would assume you checked the main on the crank itself, and did you take a peek, a peek at the, uh, the top of the connector rod where it goes through the wrist pin? Because um, with that kind of momentum and that kind of pressure, you may not be able to feel it in your fingers. And I mean, just, if it's a little bit out of whack, it's gonna knock. So you must have missed something. So um, I hate it, but you're probably gonna have to go right back in there and try again. Adam's asking me, I have a 2019 Grizzly 700. It's due for its first oil change. What oil should I run? Mineral or synthetic? Cheers from Australia. Uh, I prefer a semi-synthetic. I usually don't go full synthetic. Um, Yamaha has a, a great one, and it's for the ATV and side-by-side -side market. I uh, can't remember what exactly they call it, but I know it's in that um, gold bottle, so that's the one you want to look out for. So guys, if y'all would drop a, uh, a link to that particular Yamalu product for, for Mud Power, or for, for Adam. All right, uh, as Tim has asked me, is there any more vids coming for either a Goldwing or a VTX 1800? Actually, the Goldwing is the same one that we've had for a while, but other units have kind of pushed it out of the way, and I believe we have three or four more projects um, to do on it, and I know one of them is going to be the starter clutch, because I know that's a common thing that you have to deal with, and we're also going to actually do a clutch in it. So um, be patient with us, and we'll get to it eventually, because I... There's a lot of those out there, and uh, it has been requested before, but, but we will get to it. <clears throat> SB has asked me, some of the forums have said that you get a longer gear span if you go from an 1800 to a 1300 gearbox on a VTX. Really? Huh. I hadn't even thought about even trying that, but I mean, I actually owned a, a 1300 uh, several years ago. One of my favorite machines, easy to ride. I mean, the 1800's a better cruiser, I'll give it that. The 1300 in town, yeah, that was my, my weapon of choice. 
I have to do a little bit of uh, looking into the uh, that gearbox swap you're talking about. All right, Jacob has asked me, are you able to order these two Suzuki part numbers? I don't know off the top of my head, but I bet you the guys down in Florida can answer that for you, Jacob, and uh, drop something in the chat as to yay or nay if we have them. Zayed is asking me, in my country, I have 91, 95, and 98 octane. Yes. Can I use the 98 for TRX90? That's, cut, that's pushing it a bit far because uh, the octane rating determines where it's, what kind of compression it has to have to effectively ignite. Um, I'd run up, shoot, you could probably get away with 91. I mean, why go to the 98? I'm envious though. I wish I could run that in my race car. <laughs> but yeah, I'd steer away, I'd steer away from the, um, the 98 because it, uh, little TRX-90, it just doesn't have the type of compression. You really need to take advantage of that octane rating. <clears throat> Giovanni is asking me, non-ethanol good for your bike, better than ethanol. It's going to burn it the same. You're having a little bit of ethanol in there. It's not going to bother it. The problem with the ethanol is that if you let it sit for any length of time, it, it ha what happens is that it phase separates. It actually drops away and that makes a mess out of things. So if you're running your bike on a, or your ATV on a regular basis, then ethanol's okay. But if you're gonna put it up for a few months, do yourself a favor. I go with some non, store it with a tank, a full tank of non-ethanol. I mean, uh, that's the way to do it because leaving ethanol in a, in a bike for a long period of time, it doesn't work out well. And not to mention, um, the ethanol is a little bit tougher on the, the fuel system as far as the hoses. It will cause them to actually break down on the, those inner walls uh, from the way they're constructed. So um, sure, run ethanol, but don't store it with it in there. All right, Zai came back and says um, his 91 octane has too much ethanol. Well, we just talked about that. Then I guess you can get away with going to 95. <laughs> oh, Adam, I, I'm, I'm no such legend, but thank you. Thank you anyway. All right, uh, Tommy says to me, how do you fix a backfire on a Yamaha Bear Tracker? Well, a couple of questions. What modifications have you done to it to maybe that may, maybe would have brought on a backfire? Have you changed out a different muffler, different intake? Because it sounds like it's um, a little bit uh, maybe trying to ignite back through the intake. I mean, that's basically what a backfire is. So I'd be curious what modifications you've done to it. Mud is mud power. Mud mower is asking me: Is there anything to do after rebuilding the engine? to get the oil up quicker so it doesn't run out oil for a bit. But the biggest thing is when you're doing a, a, an assembly is to actually use assembly lube on all your different bearing surfaces. Beyond that, uh, what I will typically do is I'll, I'll crank the engine over you know, 5, 10, you know, 15 times with a spark plug out or spark plugs out just to prime up the, uh, the oil system, especially if I've gone all the way down to the crank and if everything is completely disassembled. It has to reprime, so to speak, even though that the oil pump is sitting in a, hopefully a pool of oil down at the bottom of the engine. But um, if you did not use any um, assembly lube, then that's what you need to do. Is just let the en engine crank over just with the starter and then fire it up. <coughs> Derek has asked me, I've got a 17 Honda 250X dirt bike back fender on back order, wondering how long it would take that to get back in stock. Well, Derek, I won't know that off the top of my head, but um, I bet you the guys can look into it and find out because if we don't have it and we haven't gotten it, it's the supply chain you know, from Honda that's, um, that, that's holding it up. And I'm pretty sure they can get back in touch, or we can get in touch with Honda and say, all right, guys, come on, you know, when are, are y'all going to get this back in stock? Because I guarantee you, if we got it, it gets out to you quickly. All right. Yeah, go ahead and use the 95 if you're afraid, as I add, if you're afraid to use the 91 octane. But as I said, I would run it with the 91 usually. And then if I was going to you know, put it up for the, uh, any 
any length of time more than a month or so, go ahead and fill it up with 95. So how about we meet in the middle on that? <laughs> Jennifer is asking me, when putting a crankshaft back into the case of a 2006 R6, how will I know um, if cylinder number one is uh, on at top dead center on the right stroke? Well, <coughs> your crankshaft really doesn't care. I mean, it's going to hit top dead center regardless. And as far as being the right stroke, that's determined by your, your valve, your, um, your actual camshaft, where it is. So that's where, that's where actual being on the compression stroke comes into play. Now, you bring up, T, you bring up number one to top dead center, then you, you determine the stroke by what position your camshaft's in. Still learning, aren't we all? <laughs> all right. Abu is asking me, CV joint boot installation tool removal AIR without removing drive shaft. Is it a good tool or not? I'm not familiar with that one, so I'll have to take a peek and see what you're talking about. And I, I would assume that um, you're talking about doing a, like a split installation on a CV joint or CV boot. That's the only way I've ever seen them done without removing the, uh, the drive shaft, and I really don't recommend that. I mean, you can do it as a, a quick fix just to get you through the weekend because you don't want to break down your whole machine you know, at the trailer track, but I'm not a big fan of split CV joint or CV boots. All right, Justin is asking me, uh, he's got a 2013 Polaris Sportsman 850 XP. 520 code. What's the best way to tackle this? Please help. Justin, as much as I know about Polaris Sportsman 850 XPs, I can't come up with a code off the top of my head, but what we can do is make a note on that, and then I can find out what a 7 code is, and then maybe get that answered at the beginning of next week. So you'd have to be patient with me a little bit there. All right. Joe had asked me, help, I am 60 miles away from the nearest mechanic. Good gosh, where do, you live? where do you live? I just purchased a new battery, and when I brought it home, uh, I did a static reading. It was only 10.75 volts, volts, so I put it on a battery tender, and had not been able to get it any higher. I connected it to a starter and was able to get the engine running, did a voltage check, and it was bouncing between 9 and 12 and a half. Is that my stator? Um, no, it, it sounds like you started off with a bad battery to begin with. It may be a new one, but at 1075, that tells me that there's probably a cracked cell in between you know, two of the cells to get that voltage on a, fur, on, on a full charge. So I think we need to punt and start over with a new battery because that, that, none of that sounds right. I mean, once your battery's prepped and ready to go before you even put it in the machine, it should be 12.5, 12.6. Yeah, so I think we need to start over on that. All right, John is asking me, hi, I have an issue with an 04 GSX-R600. Anytime I connect the battery, it starts turning over. Oh, boy. I get no power to the dash and the kill switch or start bu bu button does nothing. I am assuming it's the starter relay. Should I replace the starter relay or is there something else I should be looking at? Oh, um, definitely need to look at that immediately. Well, because on your starting circuit, you've got the ignition, it turns it on, that uh, brings the machine up, and then you actually hit the start button, and that is what triggers your um, starter solenoid. So first, I'd unplug the, the, that particular circuit on the starting solenoid away from the system and make sure when you connect to your battery, it didn't just start turning over, if I'm understanding you correctly. If that's the case, it's your starter solenoid. As far as you not getting any power to the dash and the kill switch, the start button does nothing. Mm. Find out about the starter relay first and let me know because, good grief, if, if it's okay, all of those things combined makes me think you have a serious issue going on with your wiring harness. I mean, because it sounds like four or five wires are just burned together from what you're describing to me. So let's isolate the starter solenoid and then get back to us and let me know what you find. 
All right. All right, Maddie's asking me greetings from Finland. Hello. Is it possible to make a video of a 2002 GL1800 valve adjustment? Maybe not a 2002, but we can certainly do a valve adjustment on our, what year is it? Our 2005 1800. So guys, let's put that on the list. Why did I think we'd already done that one? They're all starting to run together for me now. <laughs> Justin was saying it makes the engine go into limp mode. Norm, normally the throttle position sensor or dury throttle body. Okay. I, I think that's that uh, code nine that you were talking about. Like I said, I'll have to research that one, but that sounds plausible with it being a, a throttle position sensor or, or a dirty throttle body. I would think more toward the throttle position sensor. All right, Isaac is saying, checking valve lash on the 400EX 2001 to check the intake. The motor has to be at top dead center. To check the exhaust, it has to be at top dead center as well. Yes, you are correct. And actually, well, I know we have a video on that one uh, showing you how to um, set the valve lash. So guys, if you would drop that link in for Isaac to uh, watch me do it. And I think that was at our first studio. Whew. Seems like a thousand years ago. <laughs> All right, John asked me, I have a short stop 12 volt 10 amp fuse. Is that the same as a regular fuse? Usually the ones I've heard of, they've got the slow blow um, fuses and you would not want to do that because they'll actually accept a, a small spike of a higher current. Let's say if it's at 10 amps, they could just withstand up to you know, 10, 11, 12 and then survive but I don't recommend using those. You want to you want a quick blow fuse in any of these motorcycle and ATVs and side-by-sides applications because if they see uh, that magic number, phew, it needs to go ahead and go. Otherwise, you start damaging what you're trying to protect, and one of the things you're trying to protect is the wiring harness. Tack is asking me, how about some TRX 250R content? Uh, I want to go old school. I think I know where one or two are, are around nearby. What do you want us to do with one of those? Drop us a note. All right, quit jumping around. All right, um, Mirsky's video question. 2001 Suzuki DRZ backfires when slowing down in gear. Check carb and is clean and clear. Plugs are new, cams are not out of sync. What else am I missing? Have you put on an aftermarket exhaust or anything of that nature? Because I would think to drown this out, we may want to bring up your um, maybe your idle mixture just a tick, and maybe that'll that'll quiet it or um, get it uh, quit backfiring on you. Also, make sure that your your intake valves aren't too tight. That may be uh, helping it a little bit. Michael saying, John, me and a friend love watching your videos. Thanks for the machines you work on. You're very welcome. All right, Eric, is that me? Um, 06 JR50, brand new clutch, fresh top end, struggles under load going uphill. That makes me wonder if the, uh, the carb may, you said it's a brand new carb? That makes, sounds to me like the, uh, like the main jet isn't is probably the wrong size. Sounds like it's starving it a little bit. So my advice is to do a wide open um, cut, pretty much just run it in whatever gear for you know, 20 or 30 seconds, you know, near full throttle, cut your ignition, and then do a plug read. If it's just completely white, that means it's running too lean and she wants more fuel. So you need to adjust your, your main, sounds like. Stuart is asking me, a 2014 Grizzly 700 re oh, re-greased the primary rollers and sliders, oh, okay, and the clutch. The clutch seems to be rattling a lot, one-way bearing or a wet clutch issue. Well, I th that, that's a really good question, and I went through both the, uh, the, the primary and secondary clutch, and then I went in and re rebuilt the... Um, the wet clutch, the centrifugal one on the inside, 
If it's sitting there and it's just rattling, sitting still, that makes me wonder if it's something still in the primary clutch. Um, let's hope that it is. That's the easier one to get to. Go in there and just start feeling, get the spring out of it, take it off, get the spring out of it, and just feel the tolerances and see if you feel, feel it moving around too much. If that's the case, you need to start replacing those bushings if they are replaceable in that one. I think they are. Uh, if not, it, it still would seem unlikely to me that it's the centrifugal because that's not going to cause a rattle. It, it just makes it, usually you have to go to a higher RPM before it actually engages properly. So uh, I would still concentrate on the primary and secondary sheaves you know, on the, the belt side of the, of the system. <clears throat> Ryan's asked me, hi John, I have a 2011 King Quad 750 and I ripped the CV boot coming out of the front of the engine to the diff lock. Is this a difficult job? You know, either being a front or a rear um, prop shaft, if you want to call them that, uh, those, those are usually kind of a pain. Uh, what you'll end up doing on, I haven't done that particular make and model, but what I typically run into on uh, any of the four wheel drive uh, utility ATVs is you end up having to pull the, the CV joints out of the front, left and right, and then you're able to pull what I call the front chunk or the differential out. Now, which direction is it going to go? I can't answer that off the top of my head. But uh, is it beyond what you can do? No, of course not. Uh, just keep up with uh, where all the bolts came in or came out of and where they should go back in. And uh, a great way to do that, if you can't remember it all like I can't, is you know, bring up your particular make and model on our exploded parts diagrams on the website. And that's going to show you exactly how it comes apart and more importantly, how to get it back together. So good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. Oh, all right, we'll do one more. All right, I'm going I'm to take an easy one. Boy, they are stacking up. Justin is asking me, what machines do you ride? All of them. That's part of the fun of this job for me is you know, we, uh, we actually buy the units that I work on, and then I have to go and properly test them once we're finished with them and uh, then put them up for sale. So, But my favorites? Uh, that Razor 900S, that's one. Uh, the one I'm looking forward to the most to getting getting behind the wheel of, the YXZ1000R. I'm really looking forward to that one. Hint, hint, Tracy. I want to get back to work on that one. I'm tired of seeing the transmission sit over there. All right, guys, there goes another 30 minutes, just like that. I think we're going to call it a day. All these other questions, guys, if y'all would make note of them. And I will lead off with them next week. All right, guys, we just want to say thanks for coming in and spending a little bit of time with us and especially shopping with us at Partzilla because it makes all of this possible. And I really enjoy doing this and spending some time interacting with you. Um, listen, have a great weekend. Have a good week. And we will see you next Friday at 3, God willing. Y'all have a good day. Thanks. Took off my glasses too soon. I forgot I have another job to do over here. See y'all later.